Hello and welcome to another lecture from the Methods Lab and for Research Methods 2. Today we'll be talking about ethnography, participant observation and breaching experiments. All of these are in the domain of qualitative methods as we'll talk about in a bit. So the agenda for today is the following. We'll first talk a little bit about the course and how it will be structured, what, we, what you'll be doing in this course. And then we'll continue on to have a brief introduction into ethnography. This is an addition to the readings that we're doing as well. We'll also in that context talk about participant observation and about breaching experiments. The course is structured as followed. You know, you know about research methods one, you all uh, did that course, hopefully finished it with a good result. Um, and in research methods one, we talked about different foundations for doing research. So what, what's the philosophy behind uh, research methods in, in, in the first place? And then why would you choose certain different types of approaches? And we, we've identified two main families of methodological approaches. One is quantitative methods, the statistics that we all worked on. And the second is the qualitative methods. In research methods one, we address the quantitative methods in some detail. And research methods two now will go deeper into the qualitative methods. So this is just a second chapter, so to speak, of uh, a grand tour of research methods that uh, exist. And that will be the first three weeks of this course. Um, the, the following weeks after that will really be geared towards you working on your own research projects to bring all of this into practice. And you have a lot of freedom to actually give shape to that. And in that context, we'll talk about research proposal writing and um, we will specialize in particular techniques. Then the next period after this, we'll have the research project. In the research project, you will actually execute all of the stuff that you've learned, or at least the ones, the, the things that you think are relevant for answering the question that you yourself can set in a team of three students. Specifically in research methods too, after we discuss the qualitative methods, which we'll uh, start about uh, doing today, we'll have uh, three uh, special meetings, so to speak. One will be the poster session, and the poster session is a, a bigger meeting with all of the students together, where every, every individual student will pitch their research idea in the form of a poster, as the name implies. And that should have things like a research question, a tentative type of method that it will be. So will it be statistics or will it be a qualitative in-depth interviewing um, stuff like that? And what do you expect to find? How do you want to uh, structure your project and all that stuff? So how you do this poster, this is all detailed in the course manual that is online. So I will just refer you to that. But there will be a specific meeting that you are strongly encouraged to um, attend because at that meeting, we will also form the groups in which you will be stuck uh, for the remainder of the semester, so including research project, and we will build the tutorial groups based on the, that poster session. So it's an important meeting to try and attend. Then in the um, after the middle of the course, we will have uh, two weeks where we organize workshops. These are organized by the methods lab, lab and the um, coordination and research methods, the, the courses. And what these are are um, a whole bunch of workshops that you get to choose from. So they um, are typically invited guest speakers from either at uh, UCM or uh, University of Maastricht or uh, from outside the, of the university, from another university. We bring in these people here at UCM and they each provide a workshop of at least two hours. Some of them might be slightly longer uh, than this uh, on a specific technique. So this could be uh, a more intermediate version of doing statistics um, in either SPSS or in another software pro program that we might offer in a workshop. It could also be about uh, an applied version of uh, how do you do ethnography, what we'll talk about today. It could be about breaching experiments, again, that I'll be introducing today, um, or about social network analysis, discourse analysis, all sorts of different topics, and um, you get to choose freely from those workshops. So that should be fun. Um, details about this will be communicated, of course, uh, pretty soon in the course and how this will take place as well, like the logistics of it all. And then finally, the last meeting that we'll have in the course is called a peer review session. And in that peer review session, you are taking a head start to the research project. So in this, after the postal session is done, you will know what kind of project you will be doing in the research project course and also in which group of three students. 
And then in that group of three students, you can choose to either specialize in the same field or in different fields through the workshops. So perhaps you want to um, broaden your scope in your group and each develop a, spe a specialization, or you want to go in depth into a specific approach, all three of you. And then um, in those same weeks, you'll start writing your research proposal. And a research proposal is basically a document that outlines your plans for how you want to do research. And in the real academic world later in the future, this will be also the plan that gives you funding for things. So this is a, a proposal that you send to funding agencies or to a university, and they decide, do they, is this a good enough proposal? Are we willing to fund it? And so you'll be writing something like this. Again, this is an assignment that is detailed in the course manual. And then in these peer review sessions, we will have um, basically a meeting where all of the other students in your tutorial will give you feedback on that proposal, the draft version of that proposal, before you hand it in as an assignment. This is also what we'll be doing mostly in research project, by the way. Okay, onwards to ethnography. Ethnography is the first qualitative and a very important qualitative approach that we'll be talking about. And I'll first start with some um, definitions and some descriptions of what it is. Within that, we'll talk about participant observation and we'll also arrive at what some, something called breaching experiments. So to start, what is ethnography? It is perhaps obviously a qualitative approach. Qualitative meaning we focus on meanings and on words and on um, the things that describe a certain thing and not on its numerical quantities and its uh, numerical properties as we did before. It's often used in fields like sociology or anthropology, um, but also in increasingly, I feel, in um, some subfields of medicine, law, political science, uh, education, research, history, um, of course, and um, more and more fields are discovering this as either the primary uh, approach to doing qualitative research or at least a secondary approach that they can borrow from. It was pioneered, however, in fields like sociology and anthropology. And so this is where it borrows most of its um, beginnings and uh, assumptions and, and all that stuff that we'll talk about. So in essence, it aims to understand the worldview of people. So qualitative approaches generally um, tend to focus on humans and their behaviors and uh, attitudes, identities. And so qualitative methods generally, but ethnography in, in particular, uh, aims to understand uh, worldviews and lived experiences. The word itself comes from two different words, both Greek, I believe, ethnos, which means folk or people, as in a people, and the word graphein, which means to write. So it's essentially writing people or writing culture, as one of the main publications is called actually in this field, writing culture. Here's a more formal definition. Ethnography is the art and science of describing a group or a culture. The description may be of a small tribal group in an exotic land or a classroom in middle-class suburbia. So I chose this quote uh, because, of course, there's uh, plenty of other definitions out there um, to not only say where ethnography comes from historically, but also where it is applied today, because uh, the reference to a small tribal group in an exotic land refers to its beginnings in fields like anthropology specifically. So in cultural anthropology um, as a field developed as uh, initially as um, a um, colonial enterprise. So Western European countries mostly, of course, as you all know, had a whole lot of colonies all over the globe at some point. And um, this way of understanding um, the people in those colonies um, first took root as just sort of a, um, an enterprise by governments, agencies, companies in, in these Western countries. And then later in, in fields like anthropology took shape as what we now call ethnography. So it doesn't really have uh, a completely innocent and uh, um, a completely innocent um, history here. But um, of course, as anthropology developed as a field and became very self-reflective and very critical of those colonial practices, so did ethnography lose kind of the stigma of being a colonial um, tool. And so nowadays it's, it's usually used actually for a quite the opposite or for things that have nothing to do with it. So quite the opposite. One example might be um, an anthropologist that I know 
does a lot of research in um, Australia, Australia amongst Aboriginal uh, people there. And instead of trying to understand it in order for the government, of course, in Australia to um, be even more repressive towards these groups, um, his role, as he sees it, is rather to become sort of an advocate for these people. So, um, of course, they, uh, the, the Aboriginal tribes that he studies have their own uh, system of meaning making, their own religions, their own um, epistemologies, if you will. And um, he attempts to be sort of a translator and interpreter for these people uh, so that they can negotiate the the Western style government that Australia also has. Uh, and so this is how anthropologists might use ethno ethnography nowadays. The second part of this quote that you see here refers to a classroom in middle class suburbia. This refers to a, uh, a change in uh, application of ethnography where it used to be applied for a very long time by white Western Europeans on non-white colo former colonies. Nowadays it's increasingly used, uh, first of all, the other way around, but also um, to study uh, one's own culture or uh, subcultures within one, one's own uh, culture. So there's a, bu a bunch of ethnography about European uh, play European uh, cultures and societies and subcultures uh, or, or American ones. And so a classroom in middle class suburbia might be very interesting as an ethnography to see what the lived experience of these school kids uh, is, for example. Some characteristics of what ethnography is and isn't. First of all, it tries to be contextual and holistic. What this means is that it, um, as we discussed with the Soviet sausage paper in the in Research Methods 1 in the beginning, uh, it tries to look at the whole context of a certain phenomenon. So in the example of the Soviet sausage, it was this sausage that was still popular or again popular in Lithuania. And the author of that paper uh, wanted to look at all of the different angles that might come into play in understanding this phenomenon. So politics, economy, um, you name it, all of these different uh, approaches. Um, those different angles together is looking at the whole picture, hence the word holistic. That's kind of a way to remember that word, right? So holistic. Contextual, as in it matters which context this, uh, this takes place. So the history of Lithuania in this example is relevant. The, the types of groups within the country of Lithuania in this example is also relevant. So not all classes, not all genders, not all um, ethnic groups might uh, understand this the same. So the context in which we're understanding something, of course, is uh, essential. And again, looking at all of the different angles together as a whole and not as separate variables that we can t disentangle, but as related things and related aspects that, that play into each other, uh, we call that holistic. And it's also naturalistic and unobtrusive, meaning that uh, ethnography aims to understand a certain cultural phenomenon in its natural sur surroundings, in its natural occurring uh, state. So it's not uh, in the game of doing experiments, where in so say, think ex uh, psycholo psychological experiments, for example, right, where we have uh, a test group A and a test group B, and we give a stimulus to one group and not to the other. We have the other one as a control group. We give them a placebo, perhaps. Um, that would be an experiment, and but that's also, by definition, detached from its context and from its natural um, occurrence. And so ethnographer, ethnographers will make the claim that um, isolating it like that will kind of do away with some of the, the variables, if you will. They won't use the word variables, but just, to, just so we can talk about this. Um, that uh, taking away these different aspects uh, impacts on the natural situation. And so they want to understand it in the, in the natural context. It's also unobtrusive, meaning that we are not uh, impacting on the situation that we are studying. So we're, not, we're trying to not pollute that, that situation as it exists, even if the ethnographer wouldn't be there. We'll get back to this point specifically because there are certain cases where we might deviate from this a bit. It's also an up-close and personal and usually long-term engagement. So ethnography means that people actually go to the place that they're studying. They stay there for a long time. They build personal relationships. They themselves are the tools of data gathering. There's no survey, um, not at least as a principal uh, ways of gathering data. It's really just about building relationships, building rapport with the, um, with the people that you're studying. And it says long term, but it says it in between brackets, meaning that historically ethnography uh, has been long term, meaning uh, for years on end. Uh, 
So especially in colonial days, but also for a long time afterwards, even until uh, mid 20th century at least, people would often go uh, to, to remote field sites for years uh, to study a, a certain phenomenon, a certain culture. Nowadays, uh, not due to a change in philosophy or approach in ethnography necessarily, but rather due to a change in how academia is structured and how it is financed, this is not usually feasible for, to be away for years on end. And so new ways of doing ethnography or kind of skin uh, slimmed down versions of ethnography are uh, increasingly popular, where people will go to a certain field site for more limited amounts of time, ranging from um, half a year to even uh, just two weeks or so. There's of course discussion uh, as to to what extent this is still ethnography, but I think it's valuable to discuss it uh, in this context here. Finally, it's also interpretative and organic. So what this means is um, that it interprets the situation as we find it. Um, and um, it tries to look at the uh, organic situation that exists. So um, the data are usually analyzed in an interpretive framework. And sorry, I'm looking at my notes here. I lost uh, lost track here. <laughs> Uh, and the, oh yes, that's that's what I wanted to say here. So it's organic in a sense that the um, instruments that we use to gather data, so that's the researcher, like I said, but they do have a list of topics that they want to talk about. Uh, this is organic though, because uh, the, uh, the instrument and also the list of topics is meant to change during the process. So it's uh, very dissimilar from how we might set up, set up a survey in that, a survey is set up by definition ahead of time and then it's sent out and then everyone fills it in the same way and we cannot change it anymore. For a survey, this is very important. For quantitative methods in general, this is very important. For qualitative methods and specifically ethnography, the opposite is true because the idea is that the researcher goes into the field and becomes the in instrument of understanding this local culture. And so when they um, encounter something new, so they, they learn about their culture, their, ch their questions ought to change because their understanding has improved. And so in that sense, it is uh, organic. I said, finally, it's not finally. I have another point to make here, and that's that it's inductive and exploratory. I think that this is um, something that you will sort of intuitively understand by now because we could discuss this already in Research Methods 1. Um, but this works uh, inductively, right? So we don't usually go out to test theory when we use ethnography. We go into the field to discover and to explore, to find new things and then build up from there. And perhaps at the end of the ethnography, we might build a working theory or some hypotheses, again, even though we might not call it hypotheses, right? And of course, it's exploratory, as I just uh, explained. So what do you actually do? Because um, I said it's long term, it's uh, inductive and all that things, but what does that actually mean in practice? So there's three main types of data collection. One, and perhaps the most important one, is interviews. And interviews tend to take the shape as we have, uh, as we will uh, do in, in the course itself, uh, sort of an interview in the interview training. Uh, and so these are in-depth interviews. So think about interviews ranging from um, at least half an hour to say maybe two hours, or I, I know some people who have done interviews for whole days, basically. So they spent the day with the people that they're studying essentially. And so out of every interview, in almost all situations, you would make a transcript and a transcript is basically a written down version of the interview that you've had. And so it means that you make a recording of your interview and that's um, not always possible, not in all research situations, this is uh, feasible or even allowed. Um, but in 95% of the cases, ethnographers will make recordings and then make full transcripts of those uh, recordings. The reason for making these transcripts is uh, essentially twofold. One is that you want to keep a record of the data that you have and because it's easier to analyze that way and it's also easier to communicate about it in that way. Um, the second reason is that you're doing a whole lot during such an interview. So um, relying on memory alone is going to be very unreliable, uh, in fact, because not only are you just asking questions and kind of maybe even writing down or just memorizing those uh, answers if you're not recording, 
But at the same time, you also have to keep track of um, the mood of the interviewee. You have to keep track of what they say to you because you want to respond based on what they say, not just kind of follow up with your next question. You want to, you know, respond to the conversation. Uh, and considering that the the outset is organic, as I just as I explained in the previous slide, um, it's important to allow yourself to grow and uh, understand things better along uh, the interview. So as the interview progresses, your understanding improves and your questions should reflect that. So these are a lot of balls to keep up in the air. And so a recording can give you some peace of mind and some uh, thing to look back at. And then additionally, uh, having recordings and making those transcripts, the process of making the transcripts uh, is already the first step in analysis after at least the interview, which might technically be the first step. Um, but, re but transcribing the recordings themselves will already give you some uh, idea of what might be interesting patterns, interesting clusters of things that you want to be looking at in your further analysis. And um, it's um, yeah, it's it's a painful process, of course. This transcription it's uh, it takes forever, and it's not very fun to hear yourself talk for hours and hours, as I'm sure I'll experience after recording this lecture. <laughs> but it is a very useful uh, exercise to make these transcripts. In addition, in interviews, where people often use different types of materials, so they might bring just stuff, artifacts, little things that people can talk talk about. There might be objects that they are passing in the street. Maybe the interview is taking place as they walked through a city or something. And then, of course, there's also stuff that they can bring that people can actually work with. So like, like dra drawings, people can make drawings, the interviewees. Um, people can draw on maps. I have I've done that myself in the past. I'll show you that in my uh, next lecture as well, some examples. And photographs, uh, things like that you can bring to, to an interview. So it doesn't have to be a dry sort of back and forth of questions and answers. Uh, preferably not, in fact. And the maps, drawings, photographs, this is something that we'll expand on in the next lecture when we talk about visual methods and uh, in the context of qualitative research. The second main type of uh, data in ethnography is just uh, observations. And observations can take different uh, forms. We'll talk about that in the next slides. Uh, but how people keep track of that is through field notes, so just basically writing down uh, notes about what they've observed. Uh, and so a lot of ethnographers will actually um, ha can carry a little notepad 24-7 um, when they are doing research, and perhaps even when they're not, um, just to write down ideas and observations, uh, thoughts that you're having about the research and about what you see in the street, for example. Um, as you have them, because uh, thoughts are very uh, fleeting and it's important to keep track of those because it also tracks your own um, development and understanding. And a related kind of similar uh, object that people will produce is uh, diaries and not such as the diaries that you might have exchanged in uh, primary school and have your uh, friends uh, write in that with nice little sort of unicorn stickers, not those kinds of diaries. Diaries uh, that just keep track of what you've been doing, who you've been talking to, where you've been, what you've seen, what your ideas were uh, in a systematic uh, manner. And these can these are data that you can analyze later as well. And it's helpful also to uh, note down when you have interviews with whom and what that kind of taught you, because that gives you some context to understanding the transcripts when you, once you start that actual analysis in a more uh, meaningful way. And then finally, uh, a category of data that's not always there, but is often uh, there as sort of a secondary source of data, which that is uh, documents and artifacts. So documents could come from an archive, it could come from someone's home if they give you um, stuff that they think is relevant for your research. And artifacts just means things, right? So it could be a little statuette that people have in their home, it could be a piece of clothing, or it could be a photograph, or it could be any object essentially in the world can be a relevant artifact. And that can be very helpful to document as well. So to really understand uh, and take apart research questions that might exist in, uh, in ethnography as a, as a field. So if we're doing ethnography, by definition, we are studying social situations. And one way of understanding a social situation is to break it down into three con constituent parts. So this is why there's a triangle in the middle here. And we could take this apart into something called actors. So actors are just simply the people in the social situation. So imagine any social situation, say um, a protest in the street, people waving flags, 
and protesting against um, whatever. That is a social situation that we could describe. And so if we were to do that, we could describe as part of that the actors. So who are the people who are there? What kind of uh, socioeconomic background is there? What kind of reasons do they have for being there? Uh, what, what are those, their identities and all that stuff? The second component might be the activities that we can describe. And so what is, this is what are the people doing in, uh, in this protest march? Well, they're protesting, but what, what else are they doing? Are they waving flags? Are they holding up banners? Are they chanting things? Are they throwing things? Are they being violent? Are they being very um, pacifist, etc.? So what are, the, what are the activities in the social situation that we want to describe? And the third thing that we could take uh, uh, out of the social situation is the place. So this could be the street that can be very symbolic that this protest is taking place, as if, if we're continuing that example, um, or it could be someone's uh, home, well, probably not for a protest, but a place is just the place, you know what a place is. These three things uh, are come from a very influential book, which is uh, called Participant Observation, simply by a guy called James Spratley, uh, a fairly old book by now, 1980s, but it's uh, still relevant today. I'm showing you this because, of course, there's different uh, ways of kind of disentangling the social situation or a social situation. But I think this is a very uh, accessible, easy and simple way to uh, really disentangle this. I just want to add a little thing that uh, Spratly didn't uh, add in his in his book here, at least not in this uh, schematic, which is artifacts. We talked about artifacts before because there could be things that we want to include in our analysis and in our description of the social situation, which is not exactly covered by actors, activities in place, but is relevant in, in that scheme. And artifacts are things, right? So that could be in the, in the example of a, a protest march, it could be the banners, it could be uh, flags, it could be the tomatoes that they're throwing. Uh, it could be anything, basically. Um, so if you look at this whole thing, when, when you're de designing your research question and your research design, it might be good to keep this in the back of, of your mind if you're doing qualitative research and specifically ethnography or a related approach, because it might give some direction and some shape to your research question and, and the things that, that what that me means for uh, your data collection. What is it exactly that you'll be focusing on? Considering that ethnography is holistic and contextual in most cases, describing most social situations, all three or all four of these things will be relevant, but that doesn't mean that you can just emphasize your questioning about one of these things. Yeah, perhaps you're not so very interested in the fact that they're protesting, but rather in the fact that uh, they're all working class uh, and all protesting in front of the government buildings, right? So as an example. This brings us to participant observation. So participant observation is not separate from ethnography, but is very much a part of it. But uh, participant observation is also an approach that is sometimes used when people don't say that they're doing ethnography. So the way to see this is that uh, ethnography is um, in some ways a collection of approaches with a certain uh, basic disposition, which mean, which is the, the holistic ap approach and the contextual and the naturalistic, all those things. And participant observation is a technique within that approach of ethnography. So participant observation is exactly what it uh, what it says in the tin. It is uh, a, a technique that involves both participation and observation. By definition, it, it needs to um, include observation because that is your recording of data. The extent to which it involves participation depends on what kind of approach you take. And th here I want to introduce you to sort of a two-dimensional um, schematic here, where on the x-axis, so to speak, uh, even though this is qualitative research, we have the, the degree to, one, to which uh, the researcher participates in the social situation that they're studying. So they can either participate uh, fully, as, uh, as, the other, as the people that they're studying are doing, um, so that's on the left hand side here, right, participant, or they can just be a non-participant and, and just be kind of on the sidelines and not really um, part partake in, in the social situation itself, right? So that's non-participant on the right. On the other axis, we have um, how you observe, not whether you observe, because you always observe, because otherwise you don't get any data, um, but the way that you observe. So on the top, we have overt observation, which means that you're there, uh, and not only are you there, but also the people that you're studying know that you are there as a researcher. 
And then the bottom we have uh, something that sounds very sneaky, which is covert observation. Um, that means not necessarily that people cannot see you, right? But they don't know that you're there as a researcher. So these four axes give us, uh, or four points on, these, on this uh, schematic, give us uh, four specific roles that we can discuss a bit. Uh, and the first one here is announced participant. So this is a type of uh, researcher who is, um, this is sort of the, the stereotypical archetypal participant observation ethnographer uh, in a way. So these are people who uh, go to a certain field site, a culture that they want to study. And people who are there, they know that they are there as a researcher and that they are there to study them and possibly also about what exactly. Um, and they kind of just take him in and the researchers participates in the whole thing. So as an example, um, a friend of mine did um, research in Estonia uh, in the folk dancing uh, scene amongst other places. And so she went to a folk dancing group, became a member of that folk dancing uh, team and went to all of the um, trainings and matches with the with these people. But she did say that she was a researcher there. The thing that happens in this situation, and if done well, hopefully, is that even though people will know that you're there as a researcher, at some point they either kind of forget or they, uh, I mean, not completely forget, but they kind of lose interest in that fact or they, they just, just and stop caring about that, basically. The reason for that is because um, being there for such a long time, participating, becoming one of them, also builds personal relationships. And the, the researcher, like I said, is the instrument of data collection. So becoming uh, a member and a, a participant in, in a situation like that doesn't only give you um, uh, the perspective of an insider, which is key, but also allows other people in that situation to take you uh, in and to trust you as one of their own, which gives you a different kind of perspective as well. So they will trust you with more um, um, date, more details in the data, but also you'll notice um, more um, unspoken rules, so to speak. So things that are hard to really ask people about just because they are so banal, so day-to-day uh, -day kind of uh, things that you could observe. All right, enough and about the announced participant. This is the, cl the classical role, so to speak. We might also have an announced observer, someone who is there and no people know that they are there as a researcher, but they don't really participate all that much. So they are just basically sitting on the sideline. This would be someone going to these folk dancing classes and sitting on the bench next to them, just kind of making notes in his or her notepad which is fine, it's just an observer, but they don't participate all that much. And of course, this is not an either or situation. You can participate to an extent or to a lesser extent, right? Then we have the undercover participant, someone who participates completely, but people do not know that they are there as a researcher. This would be just joining those folk dance groups as an example, and nobody knows. You, they just think that you're um, an Estonian interested in uh, folk dancing or a foreigner interested in folk dancing, and you know, you're know you just part of it. Um, this might not always be ethical, um, of course, we can discuss this more in the tutorial, um, but sometimes it is necessary or unavoidable. And then the most sneaky kind perhaps would be the undercover observer. And this is not necessarily someone who hides in the bushes with binoculars, but it can be, I suppose, or it could be someone behind uh, a hidden camera, but it can also be someone who is just plainly visible, but they are just there watching, right? Nobody knows why they're watching or who they're watching. Um, perhaps people don't care all that much in some situations, but nobody knows that they're there as a researcher and they are, they are also not participating in the uh, social situation that's being studied. Yeah, so we can discuss the ethics and the benefits and disadvantages of all these positions in the tutorial in more detail, but I think this kind of gives you uh, an idea. By the way, another reason why you might choose one of these aspects is not just um, ethics as sort of a moral consideration, um, well that, but also uh, uh, your own ethics. So what are you okay with doing? So the same friend that went to folk dancing groups went, also went to um, some sort of right-wing older people there in Estonia who would also organize uh, sort of get-togethers or rallies, if you will, or uh, commemorations really. <laughs> where some of the more extreme groups would uh, bring questionable political symbols as well. 
because Estonia, as you may know, has been a member, not a member, has been occupied, as, as, as at least Estonians will say, by the Soviet Union, but also by uh, Nazi Germany before that. And as a result, these commemorations can be symbolically complex, to say the least. And so she went with these, uh, some of these old people in a, in a little van to one of these commemorations. And when they got out, she didn't know this ahead of time, but when they got out, everyone was handed a, a banner or a flag to kind of protest at that comm commemoration. And they were also handing out sort of Nazi or SS uh, symbol flags, which she could have just picked up and pretended as, if, as though she belongs. But for her, this was sort of a, a boundary that she would draw for herself. She was not okay with doing that. So of course, this is very important to keep in mind as well. All right, so specifically on observation, I said that we would get back to uh, different types of observation. We can keep this kind of brief. There's two main types where um, the first one we record first and then structure that uh, data later. We call that un or semi-structured observation. The alternative would be structured observation, as you might have guessed, which is to structure first and then record later. So what you can imagine here is structural observation. We had a group in, in the research methods courses at some point who wanted to know something about uh, gender and hitchhikers and whether uh, female, hitch uh, female drivers would pick up female hitchhikers more often than um, men would pick up men etc so they had all these types of gender slash hitchhiking questions and so for them they couldn't really stop to do in-depth interviews with all of the drivers because for one thing they the ones that didn't pick up any hitchhikers would just kind of um, continue driving and there's no time to interview people and so what they did is just basically structure first and record later they would just say okay if we were going to ob observe this phenomenon we want to observe as quickly as we can the gender, we want to uh, observe maybe the type of car, we want to observe do they have free spaces, we want to observe the place that this is happening. I'm just giving you an example, they had more more than just this. And so they structured first and then they went uh, and stand behind the uh, highway and one of them was a hitchhiker as sort of a kind of a bait for, for the uh, observations. And they would just kind of tally how many people would stop and what their gender was and all that stuff. Uh, this is structural observation. As you can tell, this is closer, to, often closer to uh, quantitative methods, but not necessarily so. We could also do structural observation in the context of qualitative research. And then a more common in the case of ethnography and qualitative uh, methods is the semi-structural observation, uh, where we record first and structure later. So as you can tell, this is inductive. We start going to the field and then we kind of just start noting down, making notes of what we uh, see there and what we think might be relevant for our research. And a lot of that will end up not being relevant at all, but we don't know that at that point. We'll structure that later. We'll, we'll cluster which things that we think will be relevant uh, in a later session, much like we, we might with the um, transcript from the interviews. So here's an example of uh, actually a non-human uh, type of observation. Well, the researcher is human, but of course, as you can see, the researched are not. This is Jane Goodall, who uh, is a famous uh, primatologist, someone studying uh, apes. And um, she was uh, uh, well, an anthropologist as well. In, in the US, the definitions of anthropologist might be slightly different from most European countries, but let's call her primatologist for now. And instead of numbering the chimpanzees, she was one of the first people to give them names, like, for example, Fifi and David Greybeard. I believe that these are uh, Fifi and David Greybeard here in the picture, but I'm not sure. And so she observed them to have uh, unique and individual personalities. And that at the time was a very unconventional idea because researchers before her would have a very structured observation where they basically would have the assumption, well, a chimp is a chimp, therefore we'll just give them numbers. This is chimpanzee one, this is chimpanzee two, chimpanzee three, and we're going to assume that they kind of all behave more or less the same because they are chimps and they are just, you know, wired the same way. Of course, we wouldn't assume this with humans in all cases. Of course, for some psychological research or sociological quantitative research, this may be true and this may be valid in some cases. But for anthropology and um, ethnography, qualitative methods like these, of course, that's not the assumption, right? So people have their own qualities. 
And so she did this as well. And she did find different types of things as a result. So she, she would find um, that uh, it isn't only humans who have um, a personality or are capable of rational thought and emotions like uh, joy and, and, uh, and sorrow. Uh, and she also observed different kind of physical behaviors, such as hugs and kisses and pats on the back, and even uh, things like tickling, uh, things that we now would consider uh, very human actions, or at the time, right? Now we know that chimps do this as well. And um, so this is an example of, um, first of all, a, a sort of a different approach that is more contextual, so to speak, but also a, a less structured approach compared to all the, some of the other observations at the time. As you can tell from the picture, she's sitting very close to these chimpanzees as well, which is another sort of characteristic of what ethnographers and anthropologists uh, might do, at least that reflects it. She, she's building rapport. The, the chimps trust her. These are wild chimpanzees. They are not in some sort of uh, training habitat. Um, also, this was very atypical for, uh, for the time, right? So this uh, building relationships. To um, just give you some tools to think about how you might set up your research if you are going to do qualitative research um, in general and uh, sorry, ethnography uh, in particular, is the follow following words to describe um, different roles that we might have during, during research. It's emic, etic, and after that we'll discuss um, identity a bit. But first, emic and etic. This is sort of a word pair that we can... Um, uh, used to talk about research. And they both refer to um, the job that the researcher uh, is doing. So in ethnography, in anthropology, in ethnography, in qualitative methods generally, considering that we are, uh, our aim is to understand the worldview of people, we are also interpreters. We are translators between what people say that they do, what, it, what they tell us in interviews, what we, uh, what we hear from them, their perspective, and the, um, what we observe that they do, or how we interpret what they do. So in other words, the academic audience that we're writing for after the fact as well. And so there's always some degree of, of translation happening between uh, the emic level, which is the from the inside, so the, the way that a phenomenon is seen by the actors themselves, and the etic level, uh, the way that a phenomenon is seen from an analytical or an academic perspective. Right? So that those two might not be the same. In fact, it can be very opposite sometimes. Uh, and there's always some balancing act between the two. And of course, uh, different fields, different uh, people will have different preferences for which one should be emphasized. There's people who go um, all the way into either one of those sides, right? even when reporting. And this leads to things like trying to use uh, poetry or um, sometimes documentary as well that can be very interpretive and very artsy in a way to try and convey the emotion rather than sort of the objective facts, so to speak, which is trying to get closer to this emic level of describing things. Just as sort of a um, mnemonic device, as in how you can, how you can, you, how can you, whether, wait, how can you remember these things, sorry? Uh, perhaps it's helpful to know where these words come from. So etic comes, um, is based on the word um, phonetic um, that you all know. And so phonetic is, um, how uh, well let's start with emic actually because it comes phonemic a word that you do not know perhaps um and uh f phonemic in uh, linguistics means that is the study of how sounds uh form meaning so we can make different sounds with our mouths and when we do we kind of put those different sounds together in order to shape words and produce meaning Right? So that's ultimately built from the building blocks of, of different mouth shapes. Um, phonetic comes from the ling linguistic term phonetic. Uh, sorry, etic comes from the ling linguistic term phonetic, as you as you know, do know probably. Um, but in linguistics, this, this is the study of sounds in human speech and how they are performed. So phonetic is the actual way the mouth moves. Phonemic is how those movements then how those sounds then form me meaning. So that kind of translates to what's happening here, right? So uh, phonetic, etic, how it actually moves, how it actually is seen from an objective perspective. Um, phonemic or emic, how is meaning produced within the context? Yeah, I hope that uh, is not too confusing here. 
Okay, and then a little side note, which is not necessarily connected to EMIC, but sometimes is, is the um, uh, researcher's own identity. So it's important to, when you go into a field um, that you um, are aware of how other people might um, respond to your identity and not just how you identify as an individual but also how they might see you so as a, a very silly example perhaps or a very clear example at least um, if i as a man would we want to do research amongst uh, let's say uh, uh, a young mothers association like um, mothers who come together to share to exchange um, tips and tricks around um, the technicalities of breastfeeding, let's say, right? Something I will probably never be able to do myself. Um, of course, I would stand out. I, I don't like the, the option of being an undercover observer in that situation is already off the table just because people will wonder what the hell I'm doing there. Um, and a participant can only go so far, right? I can't really, I, can, I can't exactly participate in, in all of the physical activities, perhaps, right? If, if there are any. Um, and so my own identity just in shape in terms of my body and how people will interpret that body um, will have an impact on my options and uh, on how I need to then approach my research and, or whether or not I can do it at all. Uh, so of course a similar thing happens with other types that we might, other things, aspects about our bodies and our histories that we might uh, attach meaning and identities to. For example, just uh, skin color, right? If I um, um, as, as a white person go to uh, some remote African village to study people ethnographically there. Of course, people will notice that I'm not from there just by the way I, I look. Uh, and so that means that they will approach you differently. All of this to say that um, it limits your options, um, but you can also use your identity to kind of, uh, your identity or how you think other, others will perceive you to kind of um, uh, get some advantage out of it. So. What might happen, what a lot of anthropologists will do who uh, go to a, like a remote uh, village, for example, that I mentioned in Africa, right? A white anthropologist going to a remote uh, village deep in Africa. Um, if it's clear that you're not from there and you don't understand anything from their culture, that may be helpful if you're interested in very basic um, aspects of how people organize themselves there culturally. So for example, if I wanted to know about which gender categories exist in this village or in this in this local community, um, imagine having to explain to someone um, the difference between men and women, for example, right? These are social categories ultimately that we have, um, but explaining them is not something that, that comes to mind that you would have to explain them. Um, and it was also, it will turn out very difficult um, if you have to go beyond the, the very basic physical differences, of course, that we could use. Uh, but gender roles would be more difficult to kind of describe in a few words, right? Um, and so what happens if people will see you as someone who doesn't know anything is that in a lot of cases, they will treat you as though they would tr treat a child, right? Um, I have a couple of young kids at home and I sometimes have to explain to them these very basic things, which is exactly what you would do with someone who doesn't know anything about the culture that you uh, that they are there to study, right? So it can be an advantage as well. But what I'm saying here is be reflexive and um, critical about uh, your identity here. All right, as a last category, we're arriving at uh, preaching experiments. And I'm talking about preaching experiments here for, for a couple of reasons. One is, um, as you'll, uh, I'll explain what it is in a second. It's It can be a fun and interesting different type of approach that we could use. It's not the same as ethnography, even though it can be part of it. Um, but both of those things are, are in the context of ethnomethodology. So ethnomethodology is an umbrella term meaning referring to the different ways in which uh, we can employ research metho methodologies to uncover the unspoken rules that direct ordinary life. So like I said, that could be things like gender or identity, uh, but it can also be just um, very small interactions between people. A breaching experiment then is uncovering those rules by subtly deviating from them. So breaking social rules in order to see them. In a little more detail, uh, breaching experiments is not just messing with people. So uh, there's a couple of uh, directives that, that would be wise to follow. 
One is that, uh, like I said, breaching experiments should ideally be uh, subtle. So it shouldn't be too obvious. It's not sort of a candid camera show. Um, it's uh, you're, you're trying to uncover subtle rules and therefore you also need to deviate from them subtly. People shouldn't think that you're there to do an experiment. They should think that you're you know, weird. You don't understand those rules. Ideally, the uh, breaching experiments are also ethical, right? So don't do things that are either illegal or unethical. Uh, hopefully that goes without saying. I mean, of course, what might be considered ethical is up for debate. We could talk about this more in editorial. And finally, breaching experiments should have purpose. We, don't, we are doing this for fun in the way that we are with academia and generating new knowledge and stuff is ultimately fun. Um, but mostly breaching experiments, they should have a purpose in that they answer a certain question that you might have about the world, right? About reality, about that social situation. So you need to have a goal in mind. It's not just kind of, you know, messing with people, like I said. So some examples here. Uh, there's um, some famous examples also uh, used in, in other fields like psychology. Um, one is called, um, I believe it's called the ASH experiment. Yes, um, which I'll put a, a video of that on um, on student portal. Um, but there's, there's uh, small examples that you could think of. For example, another video that I might post is where they uh, face the back of a full elevator. So uh, one of the um, uh, test um, doers, right? So the people who run the breaching experiment, they uh, go into an elevator with otherwise people who don't know that they are there. And they will just kind of, instead of facing the doors as normal people would, they face either the side or the back of the elevator and then record kind of how people respond to that and whether they think whether they take more distance from you and etc um, another thing that you could do is uh, stand uncomfortably close to someone when you when you're talking and just kind of come very close to their ear and just talk start talking like that also very uncomfortable and um, there's been studies like this actually where um, I can't remember the reference, but I, I remember reading a book where they actually looked at um, the distance that it's comfortable for people to stand at um, across different cultures. And of course, uh, kind of a stereotype, but also uh, a finding they had was that in um, European in, in Mediterranean, Mediterranean countries, this distance was much smaller than in Nordic countries. So if you're in Sweden, people will maybe stand one and a half meter apart from each other when they talk, given a certain social relationship to one another. Whereas in Spain or in Italy, people will stand like a half a meter close to each other and still be kind of comfortable doing doing that. Um, you can do little things. If you want to try this out uh, over the weekend, you could uh, do things like talk to your friends as though you're meeting for the first time uh, or strangers as though you've seen them uh, many times in the past. Um, you could um, go into an otherwise empty bus, sit, to, sit next to the one person that's sitting there instead of taking one of the empty seats uh, to look at a uh, social space. Um, you could um, have an extended discussion with your grandmother on Facebook. Uh, so there's all these um, different things that you could break in, in social interactions here. And of course, um, I'd like to do this part in a face-to-face -face lecture because it's just more fun. Uh, but as you may have noticed, this uh, there's also things that you can do even in sort of a digital format, which is to use, for example, Comic Sans here. Please don't do this in your papers. Uh, on the slide, I think that's a natural breaching experiment, maybe using too many memes that are supposed to be fun to try and illustrate your point here, using all sorts of different animations on a slide. Um, you could try this out as a breaching experiment to see what works, right? Or maybe have no slides at all for a change. Anyway, the, lim the sky is the limit here. Keep in mind, it needs to be subtle, ethical, and it needs to have a uh, purpose. But otherwise, go crazy. And here's one specifically for the men. I'm sure that most of you have encountered this to some degree, where um, this is a fun way to spend uh, your Saturday evening to do a little breaching experiment as well. That's it. Thank you for watching this lecture and um, I hope to see you soon in the tutorials or uh, in one of the, the exciting new um, meetings that we'll have, like the poster session and the workshops and the peer advising sessions. Thank you very much.